of Winterfest in the Smoky Mountains. If you haven't noticed, that guy's in the front, if y'all want to stand up and look backwards, this place is packed. We welcome you to Winterfest 2018. We're going to have an incredible week. Hashtag helping the abused, reaching out to the adopted. Have hashtag. Hashtag. That what? Hashtag. Can we just take an offer right now? Hashtag thank you. And let's give it up for four Trinity. Way to go, guys. I used to do that. All right, let's share it for three keys. I was going to say I used to do that, but I never did that. I promise you. Do you know what a hashtag is? I know what hash browns are. Okay? Anybody know what hash browns are? Smothered, covered. Okay, good deal. Yeah, but see, when I was a small child, I was attached to the machine that kept me alive and strong. And I'm still woke up. All right, so I know what the hash brown. Now I'm going to hash that. At 144 this morning, I was still getting text messages from youth pastors. One youth pastor said, hey, we just baptized 12 kids in the pool at our chalet that got saved last night. That's what Winterfest is about. Somebody else said, we had 18 kids baptized in the Holy Ghost last night out of one group. That's what Winterfest is about. Got back to my hotel about 1.30 this morning, and I sit down, and I grab my phone, and started checking the text messages. And I can't tell you the numbers of individuals, pastors, youth leaders, started saying, hey, we had 19 receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We got back to our cabin and baptized in water seven people. That's what Winterfest is about. But I looked at my phone, I have a niece who turned 13 this year, and she came with our youth group. And she said, Uncle David, can I just tell you what Winterfest, my first Winterfest, meant to me? She said, Tonight, I spoke in tongues for the first time in my entire life. We declared last night this is no longer Thompson Bowling Arena, but this is the house of Almighty God. But right now, can we just join together? In prayer, asking God to bless everything that's done. You just join me right now. Father, we thank you for Winterfest. We thank you for this weekend. We thank you that 35 years ago that you spoke to some leaders' lives to take students away for a weekend for discipleship in Richmond and in Canada. God, for 35 years, you've been doing it across the world. Father, my prayer right now is that you would go with each one of these teams and each youth group back to their homes. And God, you give them safety. And Lord, the lives that you have changed this weekend, that God you would give them strength to walk through the fire, to face the, the problem Satan brings against them. And Lord, that you just give us your strength together to meet again. And God, if the, if the next winter fest is in heaven, that God we will be there. Our fish right here, that Lord, you would also be there and touch us together in our hearts and our minds and our soul in the battle that we face every day. We praise you and we thank you right now, Lord, for all that you have done this weekend. Lord, right now it's 20,000 plus people. Just speak your name. We give glory and honor to you. Just say his name with me right now. Just say it together. Jesus. Just say it again. Jesus. One more time. Jesus. At his name, demons have to tremble. At his name, sickness has to flee. At the name of Jesus. Every other king in power has to bow down. Is that your Lord and Savior tonight? Maybe. Just because you put a event on the calendar, events like this, weekends like this, don't just happen because you put them on a the calendar. We understand that Winterfest doesn't just happen because you pencil a date on the calendar. Just because you pencil an event like this on the calendar, events like this don't just happen because you put it on the calendar. Things just fall into place and, and it happens and it becomes an incredible weekend. But have an event like this, you don't just put a date on the calendar and it, and it just works. No. There are a lot of people who've worked very hard since last year to make this thing happen. And when they started a year ago, many of them working to make this weekend happen. A group of men and women that work all year long to make this happen. But a lot of time, energy, effort. A lot of time, energy, and work. Energy, thought. A lot of backstage, a lot of behind the scenes work takes place. In preparation, planning, weekend. But so much time, energy, work, 
diligence and sacrifice goes in to making something like this happen. About three weeks ago, my daughter and I came in this venue for a basketball game. We parked in the garage, walked up the ramp, and sat right up there at 300 for a ball game. After I got there and got my heart rate down, I said, I can't imagine if I had 50 young people to do this with and try to keep up with them. We understand that it's, it's a load of responsibility. But from the start, I want to say thank you to a lot of people who are out there in the seats. Mom, Dad, Peter, Bus Driver, everybody back home who raised money to help you get here. It's sponsors, parents, chaperones, who have lost sleep already before the night ever came. The people who got off of work, every adult, every bus driver in the house to stand for just a moment. Some of you guys were not even born when this thing started, right? 90% of them paid their own way and received nothing in return. The people that are standing is what makes Winterfest happen. These guys are the unsung heroes of Winterfest. The unsung heroes of Winterfest are those people who have raised money, broke the bus, got your mom and dad to let you come out with them to this crazy event this weekend. The Bible tells us to give honor to whom honor is due. I want to take just a moment this morning to tell these, these guys that we appreciate what they do in making this event happen. And the Bible says to give honor to where honor is due. The Bible teaches us that we are to honor those over us in the Lord. Let me tell you, there's power in honoring your leadership. But the Bible tells us to honor those who go before us and who are She's seen all of me in my emotions and my good times, my bad times. She's seen the worst of the worst, the best of the best. And I'll tell you something: when God allowed me to marry Terry, it's the greatest decision besides choosing the Lord Jesus Christ for me in my life. But baby, I love you, and I thank God for you. Today we've come to honor and celebrate a great man, Dr. David C. Blair. There are a lot of accomplishments that David has made over his lifetime, bishop in the Church of God, state youth director, international director of youth and discipleship. He served on many boards and committees. The list, it goes on and on, but he will forever be my youth pastor. His first Wednesday was my first Wednesday in the North Cleveland Youth Group. He became, he became a spiritual father to me. He was there the night that the Lord called me into the ministry. He let me preach my first sermon. He married Kim and myself, and as I look back on those early days, just a few, a few reflections that I want to mention, and some of you guys that are here from youth group back in the days, you may remember some of these. Teen talent, choir tours, bonfires at the Hyde's house, Janet's phone calls, Mountain Dews on the Forehead, 
canoe trips in alligator-infested swamps. David's sermon on get a piece of the rock after we had been on a whitewater rafting trip. The crash house. Volleyball nights. The all-star tour and David rushing home to make it for, for Brittany's birth. Stopping at every McDonald's from here to Canada. That is no joke. Small group points and competitions, parenting retreats, tin fall on the bus windows, Christmas floats. And I can hear him say now, boys, if you're found in the girls' room, pack your bags. You've seen Gatlinburg. <laughs> All with a common denominator of David and Janet. Little did I know the impact that this couple would have on the destiny of my life and so many others. At the time, I didn't realize that I was running with the great one. He was a trendsetter of many levels and everything that he put his hand to do. And I cherish every moment, every blizzard at DQ, every clearly Canadian, Every time he would say, come on, let's go get a hot dog. Knowing that we were not going to eat a hot dog, but we were going to go get something good to eat. When I was growing up, everywhere David was, at every place that he was at, I wanted to be there and I wanted to be in the middle of it. I think he would just make up stuff for me to do so that he had an opportunity to speak life over me and challenge me to be all that God had for my life. He gave me a confidence that God would use someone like me. See, he had this ability to pull the potential out of people and then let them go and watch them soar. And if you know David, he had this gift. He could get people to do things. Somebody say amen to that. It would make my, well, when we were dating, it would make Kim so mad because David would call us right in the middle of dinner and he said, hey man, I need you. Can you come and help? Absolutely, I'll be there in a few minutes. And then I'd hang up the call and I'd look into Kim's face, you know, and she had this look on her face. And I was like, but it's David and he needs me. The crazy thing was you never really were surprised of what you might be doing because you might be doing anything and everything. Just a few months ago, I get a call. Hey, Eddie. Can you run down to Louisiana, take a truck down there for me? Absolutely. Anyone else, you would, you would be like, you want me to do what? But not with David. Some would say, how can he have so much power over people that they would drop everything and go? Because he, I knew this that if ever I needed David, he would try to move mountains to be there for me. When my father had a massive heart attack, I didn't even call him. But guess who walked through the door of that hospital? But David and Janet. And see, you can hardly say David without saying Janet because they came as a package deal. They are a ministry team. Now, something that was modeled to Kim and myself that we've held on to to this day. And when Brittany and Bruce came along, it was no different because I can still remember Bruce rigging lights with Steve Hyde on the cherry picker for Winterfest 
And I think he was about five years old. And the whole time he's up there, they've got a rope tied around him. And I'm just going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And Brittany, because of her gift in writing, wrote many articles for newsletters and youth camps and Winterfest. I've tried to emulate that with my girls, that we have a family, and our family is a ministering family, and we do it together. Something you may not know about David, David was writing a book. He talked about the title to me many times. I believe it was part of his philosophy. The title was Leading from the Middle of the Pack. He believed in honoring spiritual authority over him. Because you think about it. Every area that he served, he had pastors over him. He had state overseers over him. He had general overseers over him. And he would receive the order. And then he would look to the the folks that were following him and say, come on, let's go. Because David was a get-it-done man. And if you ever notice this, he either released, he never took the credit. He either released the credit to those that were over him in the Lord, or he would look back at those following and say, you see this team around me? They're the ones that we need to celebrate because they're the ones that got the job done. But if, but you could be rest assured Whatever you wanted to get done, if you called on David, he would make it happen. Now, it might involve duct tape and zip ties, but it was going to happen. And I also think this. David knew a little bit of something about everything. You could ask him a question on topics ranging from airplanes to surgical procedures to property management to computers. And he either knew about it or he knew a guy. Who knew about it? He loved people and he loved helping people. He was a giver. He gave to friends. He gave to strangers. He gave to family. He gave to the church of God. All out of a heart that leads to God. And even though he had a million things to do, he was never too busy to see people through God's eyes. It didn't matter if you were rich or old or poor, or young, or whether you could do something for him, or whether you had nothing to give, he would make time. And time is the most expensive commodity. I would not be the man, the father, the minister I am today without the impact and encouragement of David and Janet. I thought I was one of the special ones. But after reading so many of your posts on social media, your story's not that much different than mine. They made us all feel special. David, may there be many chicken bones in heaven and all of Mama Joe's pecan pie that you can eat. I love you. Love you, Janet. And then 
minutes but before I do I want to do this video about what I call David Blairisms. Only, only David was the one that was able to do the Blairisms the way that he would do the Blairisms. One of his most famous I assume he has a copyright I don't know because he's the one that wouldn't let no one else use it but he'd call on Mondays and most weeks and he would call to me and immediately I had to call her ID, but I would never say anything because I didn't want to ruin his opening line because as soon as I'd say hello, he'd go like, what's going on, chicken bone? And I said, David, is this going to be a 911 call or just me and you talking? He said, it's just me and you talking. I don't have an emergency today, but I'm going to miss what's going on, chicken bone. I'm going to miss big team. He'd come into a room full of people and he'd go, big team. What's going on, big team? How you doing, big team? Because that was his terminology he used to the colleagues of the youth directors. He called them big team. Because David was bigger than life. And wherever he was at, and whatever stage he was on, it was big. And if you was part of the team, you were a big team. David always wanted to drive. Whenever we'd drive, go someplace, he would drive. He wouldn't let anybody else drive. It's me and the general and him, me and him. He'd always drive. He had two things he would do. He would take that seat back. I mean, he put it right into the back of the car and he would just flat, just rear back and drive that way. I, I don't know how he saw over the dashboard, but that, that was him. And if I was in the front, he would have it so cold. I mean, it hurt you to the bone. And I'd reach over there and I'd switch around and start fooling, fooling with the thermostat and turning that and moving that and around. All of a sudden he'd sit up and he'd say, wait a minute now. He said, he'd do like this, but sure, fat man got to have air up in here. Don't be messing with my air now. So I'd just wrap up and move on down the road and let him drive. Also, David had a deal. Uh, he'd say, come on, somebody. Or he would get out there and he would say something about what's going on, or whistle britches. And that's a southern term. For most of you, you won't understand whistle britches, so you'll have to ask somebody. But that was, that was one of his go-to lines, uh, what's going on, whistle britches. He always had, uh, when we're having meetings, David – I'd say, well, I need such and such done, or I've got a need for this over here. And all of a sudden, David would just lean up on the table. And he said, hey, 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 I got a friend, a friend, friend. I got a man. Yeah, I can take care of that. Don't you worry about that. I've got that. I, I, I've, got, I've got a friend. And all of a sudden, he'd send something back, text or whatever. said, I already got it covered. So my friend got it covered. And I looked at him, and so we'd laugh about it, and we started calling him Guido Blair because he was like a mafia warlord. He had contacts all over the place. And somewhere in Cleveland, there's a storage shed full of contacts that we need to find that David's friends, that he could always touch them and get it done. David could pull off miracles, and he'd always tell me, don't worry about it. I know there's times I couldn't find a rental car. Or I couldn't find a, the proper room. And I'd have him, I said, call David. He'll fix it. 
And all of a sudden, they'd say, there's no cars in a thousand miles. And I'd get there, get off the plane, go walking up there. And all of a sudden, they're setting a, a Cadillac or a, 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 some big car sitting there, not knowing how he did it. But that was from, I got a friend. He'd always take care of it. And it always amazed me how he would do that. Also, he had a thing for the executive committee. He loved us. Do anything in the world for any of us. But somehow or another, he started calling us the five gorillas. It was a term of endearment, I feel sure. But he called us the five gorillas. Not only that, he called us the 800-pound gorillas. I had friends where they'd be on the phone with him, and they'd call me and they'd say, man, I was talking to David Blair one day, and all of a sudden he said, I got to go. said, one of the gorillas is calling me. And so he had that terminology he used, and that became a David Blairism. And far as I know, he's the only one that's ever called us that and got by with it. As far as I know, I feel sure they have other names for us out there, but that was one for David that he used all the time on him. Also, David had a thing for him. I'm, I'm looking I'm looking forward to Manitoba. Now, folks in Manitoba, don't get offended. It's nothing about David just had somehow or another. He read something about Manitoba, and he always said, when I get finished, I'm going to go to Manitoba. And we'd always tell him, Manitoba, David, and he'll say, I'm looking forward to Manitoba. That was one of his big sayings he'd have. He'd always use a Vicky volunteer. I don't know why in the world he'd come up with that terminology, but everything he wanted to take care of, all the Vicky volunteers out there in life that's happening. He called me Dr. Chillins. He'd always say, Dr. Chillins, Dr. Chillins. And this man right here, he can make it happen, Dr. Chillins. I know there's probably plenty of other Blairisms that you probably heard out there. And uh, he'd always say, praying and taking bare aspirin. I never did understand those two together, but he'd been in a situation. He said, man, we're praying and taking bare aspirin, just believing it's going to be all right. Uh, some of the other things that he would say out there, and I don't know why he'd want to say those things out there, but he'd say no good deed goes unpunished. He'd also say, I don't know why he said this. This man would crawl up on a table and bleed for you. And he'd say that every time I'd go to a board meeting, he'd say, this man right here will crawl up on a table and bleed for me and you. And I told him one time, David, I don't mind the bleeding part, but now crawling up on the table is one thing, but getting off of it is getting more difficult in life. But he'd always say, in other words, this man will take care of it for us and got us covered. David's going to be missed. I'm going to miss him bad. He's been in my life ever since the 80s, as far back as I can remember. He's just always been there. I've never had to look for him, never had to go find him. He was just always there with his Blairisms. So I wanted to share these few Blairisms with you. And now if you'll allow me, I'm going to share with you my heart about this servant, man of God. Uh, David Carlton Blair, what a servant of God. What a gift to the kingdom of God and to the church of God. Thank you for sharing. Um, I always say I was Church of God nine months before I was born. And all I know is the Church of God. Well, I had a friend named David Blair. That he was cut from the same cloth that I was cut from. And he was a church man. He loved this church with everything within him. And he and I had a little saying we'd say together. It was a Blair Chillism. We'd say, I'm so proud to be a part of the church of my God. In history, our church, we've been blessed with talented and gifted individuals that show up for us, but every once in a while, a very rare treasure and talent will show up and appear on the landscape of our denomination. And it happened in one of those forms called David Blair, who served and walked among us. He served with excellence, capital E, everything. My little mom used to have a saying, and before I forget that, she'd always tell me about David when he was there, she said, I just love that little boy. I just love him to death. And that was, he called her Mama Childers. But she used to say 80% of life is showing up. Well, David showed up and he served us with excellence and he gave us everything that we had for us and to the kingdom. My son Jeremy put a story on, he stole it from me a few days ago about the tragic time in our family when Ashley passed away about a year and a half ago. Uh, David was just there, like in your life. We was going out to pick a grave plot at sunset. It was a day just like today. You could duplicate it right down the line. 
we get out there and it was me and it's Jeremy and it's Art Rhodes and David and we pulled up and before we could even get the car door open, David had popped out of there with an umbrella about the size of a circus tent. I don't know where he got it at. And he had us covered and he stayed with us and I watched him just talking to Jeremy, rubbing Jeremy's shoulder, speaking into him. I wonder how many times a day in this congregation that David Blair showed up with you with his umbrella and hugged you spoke a word to you. Would you raise your hand if David Bear came and ever touched you? Wow. He was generous to a fault. He's the most given individual I've ever seen in all my life. I, I've never known somebody that's so generous like David. I accused him of having a printing press over in his office because he just could take money, man. I mean, he had it. He was blessing people with it. And I cannot tell you the times I've watched my friend David Blair Go to someone with a love often of encouragement and slip it into their hand. Then he'd put his arm around him and then he'd give him a word of encouragement and invest to make an impact in their life. David touched so many in so many ways. I remember it, his passing, my two little granddaughters, Austin and Autumn, they loved David Blair to death. We're still trying to explain to them how we're going to work through this. But I remember Jerry had to sit them down and tell them and explain to them. And Austin said, who seven said, oh, daddy, said, did he die? Jeremy said, explained to her and told her and everything. And she said, he was such a nice man and so good to us. He didn't invest just all of us. He did in a seven-year-old. Autumn, who was four, said, oh, no. She called him the good man. The good man. And at Christmas, David and Janet gave them gifts like they always did. And they gave each of them an envelope. And I, I didn't pay much attention to it, and I'm not going to share the amount because it was a horrible, enormous amount. He shouldn't have done. Way too much. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden they're sitting there in that process, and she said, oh, he's, he's our friend. He's our man that gave us those envelopes at Christmas. She remembered the impact he made in her life. And Autumn, the four-year-old, who lives in her own world and quite haven't arrived yet to the logical rationale of reasoning, said, oh, my does that mean we're not going to get a Christmas gift this year? <laughs> but I said, no, the spirit of David will live on. How many of you today has ever been touched by David with a gift, with a touch, with a hug? And please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say to my closing remark right here, okay? Because it's not a carnal mark, carnal remark. But Janet, you know it and I know it. David was all about to show that man could put an event on and he would do it with excellence. And whatever he was doing, it was done for his winter fest. It was excellent. For the General Assembly, it was excellent. He loved it. It was a gift to him. And he enjoyed doing ministry that way. So today, my friend, you left me too soon. But you move to the biggest stage of all, heaven. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He's there. And they're in trouble because he's lining it up for us. Amen. <laughs> Janet, he loved you with everything within him. Brittany, you were his girl. Bruce, Kaylee, he's so proud of you, Bruce. Charlie, there's another Blairism we didn't have up here. And it's, oh, oh, by the way, have you seen a picture of my grandson, Charlie? Amen. <laughs> but never doubt his love for you. I'm going to get out of here, but I'm going to quote him. Clear eyes. Full heart. Can't lose. Well done, my friend. I love you.
Let's bathe in his Holy Spirit, the comforter, just for a moment. Thank you, Jesus.
You may be seated. There's about 38 years ago when David came to Lee and came to be part of this group of people. And we had the honor of traveling with him, being with him night and day. He was a brother to us. He was. He was a great, loyal friend. And all the things you've heard today, we've got lots of those stories we could tell. But, you know, he was, uh, he was the kind of person that didn't run from the problem. But David ran to the problem. And that's what made him a great leader, I think. Oh, it didn't matter what it was. The lights went out. Oh, yes, they get me to that dock. So I'll, I'll fix it. The car wouldn't start. Open the hood. And that's the way he was about ministry, too. Can't have Winterfest this year because we can't be inside. He said, then I'll find a baseball arena outside. Because, he said, those kids need Jesus. And that was him. It was just something about David that made us feel a little more secure when he was around. <sighs> And now in this crazy world, it's something that makes us feel a little more vulnerable that he left us here. But I know this, our hearts will never forget you, buddy. And we love you so much. Thank you for giving to all of us and being a part of Harvest. Here's that song. Many times we'd sing this song and he'd be back there playing that bass and he caught tears running down his face <laughs> because he loved to sing about the good things that would happen. Here's that song he loved and that you loved, Jenny. There's a light at the end of the darkness, and it shines for all the world to see. Oh, 
wants to be a good father with a kindly son for me. It's time for me. kind of fitting that I would follow Danny Murray and Harvest because uh, Danny my first encounter with David Blair was on the All-Star Team Talent Tour I was a wide-eyed scared little boy teenage boy from small country town in South Georgia nobody knew who I was I'm getting on my first bus ever that wasn't a school bus Traveling with a group of people all over the southeast, singing at Jubilante. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing there. Me and my sister Selena was on that trip. And man, I didn't know anyone. Nobody knew us. And all I knew is I was drawn to this big old dude who sounded like me. He had a country accent just like I had because he was from South Georgia. And I noticed him floating all over that bus, hanging out with everybody, just caring about everybody, and doing everything Danny needed him to do. Then, we, then I was a part of the, the, the famous, infamous, whatever word you want to use, phone call that we got on that trip. That, and all we knew, there was a lot of commotion because David had to get home because Brittany was coming in this world and Janet would kill him if he didn't make it back. He made it back just a few minutes before beautiful Brittany made her entrance into this world. I didn't know that just about three, oh, literally two months later, would there be a blonde haired, blue eyed, hazel eyed girl that would steal my heart. And I didn't know her last name was Blair. What I found out though was that, uh, I found out that I, Spent a lot of time at the Blair house in the next three and a half years. Now, all of you may have seen David at the big events, the big moments, and I was fortunate enough to see him there as well because he included me in those. But I was blessed to see him when the big event was over and he'd come home. The first thing he always did was kick those big old 13 size shoes in the corner He'd hug Janet, tell her he loved her, and go to the refrigerator. Because that was his second love in life. <laughs> and he would find, he, he's the one who got me hooked on Rocky Road Coke floats. Never seen anybody do that before, but he loved Rocky Road ice cream. And he had a cup that looks like it was about that big. It fit about three quarters of the way full. And then he'd pour two liter Coke. Not quite, but on top of that, and we would sit there and he'd tell me, brother-in-law, not at that time, but he would that's what he would always call me. He'd say, Red, this is what's going on today. And I'd just be amazed at all he could do, all he had going on in his life, but when he came home, he was present. When he came home, he was, he fell in love with his wife. He sat on the floor with his daughter. He played with her till either he gave out or she gave out. And then he'd sit in front of the TV and turn on the country music station because that's the only way we could get Brittany to sleep. David was a man that I have to tell you because I've seen it. A lot of people think his first heart was ministry, his first love was ministry, and that's not true. His first heart or his first passion was his family. He called Janet his queen. And he said, I definitely uh, married up. When Brittany came along, he deemed her his beautiful princess. 
And a few years later, when Bruce came along, it was like Bruce was permanently attached at his hip. Everywhere David was, Bruce was. He liked it that way. Because he wanted his family just as close to him as he could possibly get them. He felt like that he had a limited amount of time and he wanted to make sure that he spent as much time with them as possible. So he took them all over the country, carried them all kinds of places. We called it the fam van for a long time, that, uh, that gray cargo van, uh, or not cargo van, but van that uh, we all piled into. And we literally went all over the world because David wanted his family close to him. Hmm. He wanted his family near so that he could take care of them, provide for them, fix things for them, and show them how much he loved them. He did that for his extended family too. Now I want you to understand how much he loved his mama. He unashamedly said, I'm a mama's boy. In fact, Bruce said on the day that David passed away that uh, David just couldn't stand to be away from his mama any longer, so he just went on to heaven. He loved Mama Joe. He loved her cooking. He loved the way she treated him. In fact, I, this is no matter where he went, when he came home, you could see the little boy come out in David again because his mama would take care of him so well. She would love on him so intensely, and he loved it. He loved his daddy. He loved going hunting and fishing, and he loved going to the ball games and doing all the things that men love to do with his dad. In fact, Brother Blair tells the story that when he started evangelizing that, and David got up a little age, that everywhere he went, everywhere he went to evangelize, David wanted to go with him. In fact, he'd go back to the room and get dressed up in a suit or dressed up so he could go to the Revival service with his daddy everywhere he went, he wanted to be. And oh, how he loved Charlie and Kaylee. Anybody believe David loved Charlie? <laughs> if you don't know that, I'm going to say it one more time. Do you know how much David loved Charlie? David was always the man behind the, the, uh, the video camera or the camera until Charlie came along. I've seen more pictures of David in the last 10 months than I have in his entire life because he was always holding Charlie and he wanted somebody to take his picture. He loved that grandbaby. He loved his in-laws. I've never seen a man take care of his in-laws like David did. Mama was, was sick. Mama needed help. There was David. When Paul Paul needed help, there was David. He'd go check on him every day when he was in the nursing home, the assisted living facility. Even if Janet wasn't able to go, he went by because he wanted to make sure they knew that he loved them, and that they were taken care of. He did the same thing for my kids. In fact, the very last thing he said to my son that I know of, Aaron, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the work you're doing. I'm proud of who you've become. If I was missing my kids at youth camp, when David was state youth director, I knew where they were. They were on the golf cart with David. And usually he was filling them full of junk. He would say, hey, here's another canteen car. Let's go get it. Let's go get $10 worth of candy. David loved his family with all of his heart. That's my role today. I can sit here and tell you a thousand stories of what he did in ministry. I can sit here and tell you, just like you could, all the people that he's touched. But I have to believe this. This is a scripture I hold to. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And I don't know about you, but my soul is my family. And I'm going to tell you one of the, great, the, the greatest uh, treasure David had. While all the treasures of impact throughout this world, he, I know he honored and he loved. I want to tell you the thing he held dearest to his heart was those people right there. The fact that they still love God and, they, and they're serving God with all of their heart. That one day they're going to go get to be with him forever. I'm going to tell you that is his greatest achievement in this life.
He took family, the family attitude in ministry. If I've heard it once in the last three days, I've heard it seem like a thousand times. If you knew David, you felt like family. Amen. He somehow had a way of, no matter who, whether it was a casual encounter or, or an encounter that you had for, for quite a while, he somehow made, a, made you feel like you were a part of his inner circle. Somehow he made you feel like you were a part of his family. I, I believe that that was one of his greatest gifts. He carried the family attitude in the ministry, seeing others as his own. I believe that's why, in my opinion, and I'm about to be finished, that David was a generational leader. When I say generational, I'm not just talking about he ministered to a generation. I believe he was a generational leader, a leader that don't come around but once in a generation. I believe he's a genera generational leader because he proved you don't have to sacrifice family to excel in ministry. In fact, if you include your family in ministry, especially in those areas of their giftedness, and you make room for them in your calling, they'll learn to love your Savior and learn to love ministry as much as you do. I believe he was a generational leader because he proved that you don't have to sacrifice the move of the Spirit for the commitment to excellence. Dr. Childers made a mention of, uh, of it ago that everything David touched, he did it with excellence. Bruce said it earlier today in our conversation. He said, all day long, my dad would, would uh, fuss over the details. All day long, he made sure details were done. But when the service started, all he cared about was the moving of the Spirit. All he cared about was the fact that we were there to encounter God. Can I tell us that's the reason why so many young people, so many people were impacted. It wasn't because of the lights. It wasn't because of the dynamic speakers. It wasn't because of the fantastic musical groups. It was because David Blair, with passion, wanted the Spirit of God to move every time we met at Winterfest, youth camp, and because God's Spirit was there, lives were forever changed. Amen. He proved that you don't have to sacrifice one generation for another. Boy, if I've been taught anything by David Blair... I've been taught that. That you can honor the generation that is before you. You can hear their vision and go after that vision with all of your heart and honor them and still pull along the generation behind you and make them a part of the vision, not only of tomorrow, but of today. David was a generational leader. And I'm going to close in this way. David was my brother. Not brother-in-law. Not casual friend. David was my brother. He opened so many doors of opportunities for me as he did just, just like he did for you. Many of you in this room. He taught me so many things about how to love God well. And for that, David, it's been a rough eight months for this family. Eight months ago, we buried our dear Mama Jo. And today, our heart is grieved for you. But we're going to come see you soon. And we'll be with you forever. I want to ask you to do something with me. I want to ask you to pray with me for this family before we move forward. Heavenly Father, I just bless you today. God, so many things are running through our mind and through our heart right now. Our heart is heavy. Our mind don't quite understand all of this. 
been difficult, Lord, to understand your plan here. But God, we know you're good. In fact, we know you're perfect. Lord, though we can't see it all and we don't understand it all, Lord, we trust you. God, we were taught that. If by no one else, we were taught it by this man. His passion to serve you, his heart to be led by you. His desire, Lord, truly, as he said in 2012, to be wasted, wasted for this church and for this generation, most of all, wasted for you. Now, Lord, we ask you today, strengthen this family. Lord, I'm not just talking about Jan Janet and Bruce and Brittany and all of us who are physically related. Strengthen this family. Lord, all of us that were so close to him, help us to have your strength. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Many times of question certain circumstances things I could not understand and many times of trials weakness blurs my vision it's when my frustration gets so out of hand but it's then I am reminded You've never been forsaken You've never had to stand one test It's when I look at all the victories I'm reminded all God is with me And it's through the fire My weakness It's made strong he never promised the cross would not give heavy, the hill would not be hard to climb. He never offered up the trees without fighting, but he said, Help what always. We come and die Just remember when you're standing In the valley of decision The adversary says give in We just hold on, hold on I hope they'll show up And he will take you through the fire Again, I know within myself that I would surely perish. But if I trust the hand of God, you'll shield the flames again, again.
Captain Charles Plum graduated the U.S. Naval Academy and immediately became a fighter pilot, a top gun, flying missions over Vietnam, leaving from the USS Kitty Hawk 75 different times to fly 75 successful missions. On mission number 76, a surface to air missile collided with his aircraft and shot him out of the sky. He lifted the eject lever and was catapulted into the heavens, pulled the rip cord to his parachute, floated down into enemy hands. For the next six years, Charlie Plum was a resident of the Hanoi Hilton in an eight foot sail. He endured the pain, the heartache of being a prisoner of war for all of those years. When the war came to an end, You possibly have seen news footage of when he disembarked from an aircraft that brought him back to the United States and fell into the arms of a waiting, weeping wife, his children. Welcomed by then President Richard Nixon. So glad to be home. After a while of getting reacclimated to life and society, and all the emotion and the trauma that he had been through as a prisoner of war, he said to his wife one day, I finally feel that I'm able to go out for an evening. I want to celebrate you. I want to celebrate being home. I want to celebrate life as I knew it. They went to a very nice restaurant and they had not been there enjoying their main course very long until Captain Plum realized out of his peripheral vision someone was staring at him. In a little while this individual came over to Captain Charlie Plum and he looked down at he and his wife and focused on Captain Plum and he said, you're Charlie Plum. You were a fighter pilot. You've been a prisoner of war. You just got out not long ago. Captain Plum looked up at him and said, yes, and how did you know that? He said, I packed your parachute. Captain Plum eased up out of his chair and turned toward this individual and they embraced hands. And he wildly began to pump his arm and his hand. And as they were shaking hands, that individual looked at Captain Plum and said, and I guess it worked. Captain Plum said, yes, it worked. And thank you. He and his wife went home and he would write and speak later and say, I couldn't sleep that night. 
He said, I lay awake all night long thinking of that young man that was on the same aircraft carrier that I was on, and I never knew him. He said, I tried to imagine him in his sailor's cap and his bibbed uniform and going about doing his duty and working under the waterline of that ship, folding the panels and threading the silk and packing parachutes. He said, I determined that night as I lay awake, staring into the darkness, that never would another day go by that I didn't thank someone who packed my parachute. My emotional parachute. My spiritual parachute. My financial parachute. My lifelong learning parachute. And he said, from that day to this, every day I make a habit of calling at least one person, a school teacher, a pastor, a family member, and just say thank you for packing my parachute. Because when I've been ejected into the elements that I can't control, and have been forced to pull a ripcord hoping that something, someone was responsible enough to pack for me that I never knew real well, if at all. That everything would just do as it's supposed to do and the wind would catch the flaps and the panels and the parachute would do its job and I would float safely to the ground. Everything that I've heard thus far today validates and witnesses for me, Janet and Brittany and Bruce and Kaylee, that this man was a packer of parachutes. There are men and women sitting all over this auditorium today that are here because this man packed your parachute. When you got in trouble, when you were emotionally shot out of the sky, when things didn't go like you thought they were supposed to go, and this dot didn't connect with that dot, and that T didn't get crossed, and that I didn't get dotted, and this thing didn't get done, there was a man somewhere under the waterline, out of sight, behind the scenes and happy to be there, who just folded and packed and threaded and creased and put on your back a parachute. I've often said that occasions like this don't bring us together because someone died or passed away. We're here today, Janet, because someone lived. And a man's life is not determined by how much money he makes or the places he travels. His legacy is in the impact that he leaves. Janet, I want to thank you and David. You've been right there. It was always David and Janet. Never was just David. It was always David and Janet and then Brittany and Bruce. And on behalf of a grateful denomination around this world, Thank you. 
I came in late last night from a preaching appointment, and as I was coming in, I just went through my text messages as recent as two weeks ago with David, and I won't read any of these to you. They're personal. But over and over again, affirmation, love, appreciation, prayer, trust, confidence expressed. And as I came in for a landing last night, I thought, my goodness, he packed my parachute. As a legacy and a love offering expressed in behalf of David, I challenge every one of you today before nightfall, call somebody who packed your parachute in life and just say thank you. Janet, we love you all. God bless. I believe that's what he's doing. What about you today? Amen. I'm honored to, to share this afternoon. And uh, be, on behalf of Janet, Bruce, and uh, Brittany, and Kaylee, and Charlie, we are so grateful uh, for all of you being here today. Uh, all the texts, all the calls, all the food, everything that has been done in the way of expression of love and kindness uh, to the family, we are, we are certainly grateful. And it is indeed my honor uh, to get to share today. As I said uh, Monday in a post, David Blair is a hero of mine. Uh, there are no adequate words to describe the loss of David. He was my student pastor, a spiritual mentor. He was a friend. He was my brother. He's family. So today, we're going to celebrate the life of an incredible man. That's what we've come to do. It's hard to believe that we're here at this moment, but I want to tell you, these are the moments where I'm thankful for the power of the Holy Spirit to provide comfort and care for every single one of us. Before I share a message, I too would like to reminisce about David, and I know some of you are nervous when I say message because some of you know that uh, Pentecostal preachers may take their time, and since Jonathan Sawyer is going to play the organ for me, we might be here just a little while. I'm joking. I'm kidding. You can relax on that. But before I share a message with you today, I want to reminisce about David myself. And if you're going to talk about David, you have to have some type of visual aid. You know that, right? If you're going to talk about David Blair, you have to have a visual aid. So, Eddie, if you'll help me here real quick and just bring this up here. Most of the time, you never saw David Blair 
without this, this, this type of backpack, or, or this. You, you typically saw all this whenever you saw, saw David. And if you don't know David Blair, then you would not understand this right here. So, and by the way, David has 4,000 of these bags. And so I, I, I don't know which one I got, but I got one. But I know some of you are wondering, what, what would you find in a David Blair bag? Well, let, let me show you. First of all, there's going to be a pair of Crocs <laughs> in a David Blair bag. Let's see what else, what, what we find in here. Well, I think all of us know that you're going to find a Mac, you're going to find an iPhone, you're going to find an iPad all in a David Blair bag. Some of you may not realize all the stuff that you'd find in David Blair bags. So I'm just trying to help you out here so you'll get the visual of, of what's in a David Blair bag. So let's see. AirPods. You got to have a remote clicker. You got to have a remote clicker for, with David Blair. You got to have that. Let's see. External hard drive. Check. Uh, charger. I got that. Let's see. Band-Aids. You never know. You may need a Band-Aid. And... Uh, Oh, yeah, you can't forget this. You got to have one of these. And depending upon who you are, it might be this way or it might be this way. You just don't know. So this is all in the David Blair bag. So, oh, and I forgot. I forgot one thing. Peanuts for the Coca-Cola. Come on, y'all. All of these things you would find in a David Blair bag. Let me try to pack up here a little bit, all this stuff. But also when you're talking, let me take this off too. Also, when you think about David Blair, uh, I didn't bring out the zip ties. I didn't bring out the duct tape. We all know that's in a David Blair bag as well. And, and it's already been stated, David Blair had a contact for anything. Uh, he'd be like, give me just a minute. I'll be right back. And what, what Dr. Childress said is taken care of. In addition, if David was going to preach, you have to understand that he typically wore a countryman. I wanted to wear a countryman today, but, but we didn't have that available to me, or I didn't bring my own to do, so I'm just going to use the microphone provided for me. And one thing about David Blair, when he was going to preach, I told you he had the remote in his hand because uh, he appreciated the media staff, but he wanted control to advance his own slides. And so I don't have that control today, but, but if David Blair was here, one of the very first things he would show you, hopefully the media team's about to help me, is David would always have one slide with about 3,000 pictures on it. You know what I'm talking about? He would have this slide right here. The reason I know is because this is a slide that he used at my church the last time he preached for me. Come on, y'all. So David would have all of this, in, and, and I, we even cut some of them out because you, it would get lost, but David would have this type of illustration in his message. If you ever heard David Blair preach, he always had one go-to line that, that they showed on the video, and it was, as a child, I was hooked up to a machine, and it helped me survive. It's called Refrigerator. And every time he would tell that, so I knew it was coming, but every time he would tell it, David could tell it, and I would laugh. Every single time. Also, when David preached, he would always work in about his very first car and Molly's Red Fiero. It was not apples to apples to him, but he loved sharing those stories. David Blairisms have, that have been mentioned. What's going on, Chicken Bone? I'm going to miss that. That's what I'm talking about. Carl up on the table and bleed, as Brother Childress said. Thank God for the Vicky Volunteers. Come on, somebody. He loved that one. I can't wait to get to Manitoba, he would tell me all the time. He'd say something, you ain't right. It's on like Donkey Kong. Come on. Uh, this one I never really understood, but he said it a lot. Well, I'll be jumped up. I just, I never really did figure that one out, but he did say it a lot. We're trusting God, praying and taking bare aspirin. And my personal favorite, I just want to be a blessing and not a hindermint. <laughs> Love the David Blairisms. See, there are so many memories that I have with David, and it's hard to limit them, but for the sake of time, I'll do that. But David and Janet have been in my life since I was 14 years old. I remember sitting in the interview process with Dr. Walter P. Atkinson, who was the lead pastor of the North Cleveland Church of God and the interview committee. I remember when David and Janet showed up because they were running just a bit behind 
because their pastor uh, called some type of meeting or scheduled some type of event. And David broke the law considerably to get from La Follette, Tennessee to Cleveland, Tennessee. And we waited. I think we waited about an hour for David and Janet to arrive. I don't even think Dr. Atkinson asked him how, fa how fast he drove to get there that quick. But David showed up when they began to interview and the process came to completion and they stepped out of the room. Bruce Jarman, Shanna Fulbright Garner and myself who were allowed to be in there, we looked at each other and we said, this is the couple. No need to interview anybody else. And the rest was history. While at North Cleveland, we had big events. Eddie talked about those choir rehearsals. We had tours, we had activities, we had trips, we had more. But one of the very first trips that we took, uh, I can remember we were going, I believe it was the Six Flags, and we, this was the day of boom boxes. Does anybody remember a boom box? You know what I'm talking about. A uh, younger generation just looked that up. Some of y'all act like you don't know what a boom box is, but I know you do. But we took boom boxes on our trip, and in the back of the bus were, were uh, I guess, some of the rowdy folks. And uh, we were playing a song that was popular in the culture of the day, and it was by a lady by the name of Whitney Houston. And the song was called, I Want to Dance with Somebody. And one of the lyrics in the song it is, I want to dance with somebody. Don't judge me. It's been forgiven. Come on, y'all. I want to feel the heat with somebody. Now, uh, David was concerned about the music that was being played on the bus on this trip. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Now, you got to put in context why he had concerns. Because you see, he was coming from La Follette, Tennessee, with the La Follette Soul Patrol Youth Group. You got to understand, they had just come off a Perry Stone three month revival. They'd been in the inner courts, the outer courts, and the Holy of Holies. Come on now. Those kids were seeking the Holy Ghost. They were praying for each other. They were prophesying, laying each other out, covering each other up with modesty claws, picking themselves back up, and doing it all over again. And now, He's at North Cleveland. And let me just say, some of us, me included, we were still a work in progress. God was still working on us. David, when the bus stopped at McDonald's, and David would tell you, or Eddie would tell you that David always stopped at McDonald's. Eddie never stopped at McDonald's when he was a student pastor. I always stopped at McDonald's. I took that on. He told those girls, we are not going to play Whitney Houston. I want to feel the heat with somebody. Come on. But needless to say, we redeemed ourselves later on with the worship on the mountain at Signal Mountain. Teen talent choirs were mandatory for Dave and Janet here at North Cleveland. That was an expectation. My favorite competition song, and some of you who remember teen talent competition large choir songs, my favorite was We Have the Spirit of David. We always had the right music to walk into on the risers, perfect outfits, and our fearless leader, as he used to say, I'm going to be up there slapping and waving my arms. Y'all just follow me along. And he would lead us to victory. Winning international team talent was the best. Wonderful moments indeed. See, David and Janet, they always gave us our best at North Cleveland. David had a way of just making every person feel special. He knew how to add value to people. And I'm better because of his investment into my life. In fact, when I was struggling with the call of God, David's last message at North Cleveland was before going to Arkansas as the youth and discipleship director was about changing the world, decide to be a world changer. And in the reception line, he told me, he said, if there's ever been a message that I preached for somebody, Kevin, this one was for you and Janet, as she always did, because she used to always call, by the way, I forgot to say this, about choir. My mom would answer. This was pre-cell phone days, y'all. And, and she would call, and mom would answer the phone and give it to me, and it was Janet. And Janet would say, Kevin, this is Janet. We got choir practice. I need to see you there. Okay, Miss Janet. Mom would hang, I'd hang up the phone. Mom said, what did Janet say? She needed me at choir practice. You're going to choir practice. So Janet and mom made sure I was there. But I remember in that line, 
Janet was shaking her head when David was telling me if there was anybody that he preached this message for, it was for me. I never shy away to say that besides my dad and mom, Ben and Joyce, who are in the back of the room, David and Janet Blair have had the biggest spiritual influence in my life. And I will forever be indebted to them. It's been mentioned about David's involvement in Winterfest, and he's been involved with it as long as I can remember. His passion and love for students and this event go hand in hand. Countless hours of planning and serving and working and doing whatever needed to be done to make Winterfest happen. Guess who you found? David. When I came on the steering committee in 1999, I was assigned to the ushers along with Dr. Randall Paris and Pastor Anthony Braswell. We worked hard. Buckets all over us, Thompson Bowling Arena in every section. But however, when, I was, when David was promoted to the Winterfest coordinator in the youth department, I was made chairman of Smoky Mountain Winterfest, and then I moved to what we call the beloved crew. And I did not fully understand David's responsibilities, load in, load out, sound checks, lighting, rigging, staging, front of house, video, all production, and many other tasks fell to him. And I was thinking, these are incredible shoes to fill, and I just don't know how I'm going to do it. But like always, David had a way of making sure that you succeeded. David's passion for Winterfest and passing on to the next generation, the love he had for Christ, it was evident in everything that he said and everything that he did. I want to say thank you again to the family for letting me share just a few thoughts and to share a message with you. And if you'll give me just a few moments, I would like to do that. As I was thinking about what to preach to a room full of gifted preachers and communicators, initially when they asked me, I thought this is a pretty daunting task. Because like all preachers, when a preacher gives a text, I'm trying to figure out exactly where he's going to go and what the points are going to be. I'm sure you're probably going to do the same. But as I was standing in David's house on Tuesday helping Bruce and Brett pick out clothes for David, I saw all the coats in his closet and I heard the Holy Spirit say, pick up the mantle, pick up the mantle. And initially I thought that was just for me. But after praying, I believe it's for every single person that is in this room and for every person that David touched your life. We need to pick up the mantle. So for the next just few moments, let me share with you on picking up the mantle. Mark Batterson, who wrote the, the book Chase the Lion, made this statement in the book. It should be on the screen for you. An inheritance is what you leave for someone. A legacy is what you leave in someone. Leaving an inheritance is important. But more important, leave a legacy. Legacy is the influence your dream has on others even after you die. Legacy isn't measured by what you accomplish during your lifespan, but legacy is measured by the lives that, you, that are affected by your life long after you're gone. I would suggest to you this afternoon that David Blair has left a legacy that will live on in us for years and years to come. The Bible in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. You don't have a Bible that's leather bound or one that glows. It'll be on the screen for you. It says, and so it was that when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing, but nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and so he saw him no more, the Bible said. And he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them into two pieces. He also took up the Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and he struck the water and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? 
they'd struck the water. It was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. And when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, this is what they said. The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. You see, when Elijah left this earth, according to the word of God, it was in a whirlwind. When David left us this past Sunday, it seemed like a whirlwind. When Elijah left out, Elisha cried out. When David left on Sunday, there have been numerous moments for me and for us in this room that we have cried out to the Lord. I want to tell you today, it's okay. It's good to cry. It's good to have that emotion because it's normal. It's what we should do. It means we care. It means we're hurting. It also means we've lost someone that we love, that we admire, that we have respect for. It really helps us to begin to heal. The Bible said that when Elisha picked up the mantle, he declared, where is the God of Elijah? And I say to everyone in the room, if you love David Blair and he touched your life, I say to those that are watching us around the world, if you know David Blair and he touched your life and he, you know how much he loved you and cared for you, it's time for us to pick up the mantle. Can I speak specifically to us today? Will you allow me? Youth and discipleship, leaders, directors, pick up the mantle of passion for the next generation. Wherever you are, I know some are here and there's some, some somewhere else. Youth and discipleship leaders, pick up the mantle of passion for the next generation. We can't afford to lose our sons and our daughters. They need to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. One of these pictures that are, are posted by David, I love so much because it shows his heart and his love for Winterfest because numerous times he would be praying for students and young men and women and pastors and leaders to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that's what he was praying for in this picture, but I also know Eddie James was on that picture and he probably was over time and David was also praying for him to come off. Sorry, Eddie. But David prayed because he wanted people to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. David always anticipated the Holy Spirit would be present in Winterfest. It would be present in Kids Fest. It would be present in our youth camps, in our regional rallies, in all Church of God sponsored events, youth and discipleship. We've got to pick up the mantle. Executive committee and administrative bishops, leadership that's in the room. I want to tell you to pick up the mantle of casting vision and pouring into leaders. Leadership development was a heartbeat of Dr. David Blair. He was always investing in those who would listen. Listen to the wisdom that he held within him. He was a forward thinker. He was a constant learner. He had an earned doctorate. He was a leader in our movement. He was a leader in the kingdom of God. He was never appointed as a state administrative bishop, but we all know that was in his future, Manitoba was just around the corner. And I personally believe he would have been on the executive committee at some someday. I know I'm biased, but I believe he would have been. Instead, leaders that are in this room, it's up to us to pick up the mantle of leadership to carry on our movement and the cause of Christ because that's what he would want us to do. Pastors and laity in the room, Watching online, it's time to pick up the mantle to position the local church for its finest hour. David loved the local church. He loved pastors. He loved the Vicky volunteers who served so faithfully. He loved the bivocational pastor. He called pastors. He prayed with them. I know he helped even raise some money so that some kids and some churches could come. He helped raise money for pastors so that they could get to Winterfest. He encouraged pastors. He knew what it was for Vicky to have car washes, chicken dinners, 
to get kids to Church of God events to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in which he prayed would manifest. He preached in our pulpits. He challenged us to do more for the cause of Christ. And there are more people for us to win for Jesus. Pastor's laity. We've got to pick up the mantle. Former students of the Follett Soul Patrol. North Cleveland Power Connection. Pick up the mantle of David. Our Elijah. He taught us to worship. He taught us to read the word. He taught us to pray. He taught us to declare the promises of God. He modeled servant leadership. We sang, we have the spirit of David. And I believe it is more than a song, but now it is a moment for us to receive and to walk in what Elisha wanted from Elijah. A double portion of the anointing and the spirit of his mentor. I want that double portion. Students, pick up the mantle that David has left for us. Church of God around the world, distinguished guests and ministers, and friends that are in the room. David Blair, touch your life, and that's why you're here. That's why you're watching today. Pick up the mantle and declare the truths of God. Be a part of changing our world. That was the heart of my brother. Janet, Brittany, Bruce, Kaylee, Charlie, Papa Blair, Brett, Molly, extended family. Pick up the mantle of family ministry. If there's anything that David wanted was that all of you would be involved in the ministry that God had called him to. Always. Janet, there's more for you to do for the kingdom of God. You're not finished yet. The Holy Spirit is going to give you a special grace and strength to accomplish what it is that still needs to be done. Brittany, keep writing. Go after those educational pursuits. David's calling right now to remind you of that. Now, that's something he would do, right? <laughs> Thank you for whoever did that for me. That was so great. Brittany ministered to the least of these because I know that's your heart. And your dad did that. Stay missional minded. Bruce, Kaylee, use technology to your advantage as you preach the word of God. And Bruce, you are a preacher. Whatever you told your dad that was in your heart, now's the time to pursue it. Dedicate Charlie to the Lord, and I declare and speak over him a generational anointing to come on that young man. Kaylee, he loved you. I'll send you a punch list or two, because I know you're going to miss it from him. <laughs> Papa Blair, Molly, Brett. Family, do what 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, a scripture that was dear to David's heart. Whether therefore you eat, drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I want to say to you in this room, family, church of God tribe, kingdom of God, those present, those watching, we need to pick up the mantle. In closing today, my dad, Ben McGlamry, sent me a text on Sunday afternoon while I was trying to, make, trying to make it to Chattanooga, Tennessee before David passed away. And this is what he said to me. Dad, I hope it's okay if I share it. I didn't ask you, but since I'm up here, I'm going to share it. David will always be remembered as a great person and a friend who is willing to go the extra mile. Not only is this a terrible loss for the family, but for the church of God. Dad's words are so true. I said earlier in the week on Sunday that we lost a general. Now I believe we've lost a general today. A general, not just in the church of God, but a general in the kingdom of God. Eternity will show the impact that David Blair made 
for the cause of Christ. See, if you don't know the Jesus that David served, and there's a lot of preachers in this room, maybe there's somebody watching that will watch this later, maybe somebody that's here today that maybe you're separated from relationship with the Lord. You need to know this Jesus that David served and loved so much. I would encourage you, as David would, to get in right relationship with Jesus. Repent of your sin. Ask Jesus into your heart and begin to grow in your journey of faith. I miss David already. So much. God did not heal David the way the way I asked him. And I really thought that we had such a good relationship that the Lord was really going to do what I asked him to do. But I'm glad to know that David is well. So Lord, let David help you with some projects. I know you probably thought of everything because you're God, but he's going to have a punch list or two that he'd like to help you with it to get it done because he'll want it to be excellent. I look forward to seeing David again. And that is the hope that we have in Christ. Let me grab something real quick. We're going to see him again. David, I hope I make you proud. So from this day forward, until I take my last breath, I'm going to pick up the mantle. And I'm going to declare, where is the God of David Blair? Won't you join me? Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we come to you now in desperate need of comfort. Your presence and your power are what we desire in this moment. Father, I bless Janet. I bless Brittany. I bless Bruce, Kaylee, Precious Charlie, Papa Blair, Brett, Molly, and the extended family. Holy Spirit, please be close to all of them. Touch David's extended family and the Church of God family. And thank you for blessing us by giving us David these past 56 years. Just as he has, will you help all of us to finish well the race set before us so that we will all, when you're ready, be reunited with David again. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayer. Amen. I love you. Thank you. Bless your family. Shall we stand together as the family is escorted as soon as they are out of the sanctuary, then you will be invited to leave. I've been asked to ask you to please observe social distancing on your way out move slowly as you're being instructed by the funeral directors through it all through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God sing it 